they take a sadhu in India, a religious yogi, and they have him smoke five meo DMT. Now, Are five in a return to spirituality in the West. While in the West, the church and organized religion is shrinking, there are two groups of people that are not only exploding in growth, but they are intersecting. Around 30% of Americans are identifying as spiritual, but not religious now. And that is up drastically since 2019. And those who have experimented with psychedelics has tripled over the last few years. And it's becoming more evident how these two groups are converging. Now, I am a lifelong student of spirituality, but recently I have gone down this rabbit hole concerning psychedelics for three main reasons. First, all cultures, Central American, Eastern, Asian, South American, North American, African, have had some type of psychedelics in their spiritual history. I mean, we can take, for example, the artwork that we found in caves and on ancient rocks. We find drawings of mushrooms from thousands and thousands of years ago from places as far apart as Africa to Europe. And this shows us that people from different parts of the world who had no way of communicating with each other discovered the power of these plants and mushrooms on their own. In a lot of traditions, these psychedelics were considered gifts from the gods. They were used in important shamanic rituals. These shamans were like medicine men or, or even spiritual leaders of communities, and they used them to foresee the future, to go and talk to God, to find solutions to problems as medicine, uh, a wide variety of things. But again, the point I'm driving home is this just wasn't happening in one place. It was practices that are spread across continents from native tribes, North America, South America, uh, of all religions, as Europe and Asia, you name it. Now, as time went on, a lot of these practices were forgotten uh, because of science, because they were hidden away, because of new religions, because of new laws. But the evidence can't be ignored. It tells us a story of humans that have always sought to explore the spiritual world and find meaning in life, often with the help of these powerful natural substances. So when I talk about psychedelics being part of spiritual and religious practices, like I'm not just making this up, history, science, archaeology have shown us this connection is as old as humanity itself, helping people feel closer to the mysteries of the universe and what lies beyond. Now, the second thing that's caught my attention and drove me down this rabbit hole is the amount of psychedelic churches and retreats and medical experiments they're exploding in growth and you're starting to find them everywhere. And one of the studies that most piqued my interest was a study done by John Hopkins, where they gave uh, psilocybin heroic doses, it's five grams or greater, to people from various walks of life, cancer patients who were terminally ill, religious leaders, a wide variety of people. 75% of the participants of this experiment walked away and months later, still said it was the most important experience of their life. The most important experience of their life. These were people, some 50s, 60s, and 70 years old. And thirdly, as I said in my last video, I've had a few mystical, psychedelic, if you will, experiences in my life without the use of psychedelics. A couple I would classify as Christian-themed, and the most recent one might be more yogic sciences or Hinduism. But nonetheless, they also were, to me, the most significant experiences of my life. So as I listen to these other people describe their experiences, they sound so similar to mine. I'm asking myself, did we have the same experiences? And if so, are these hallucinogens, or is that what they are? Are they creating hallucinogens where people are seeing things? Or are they really creating divine, mystical experiences and encounters with God? Now, I can't wait to get in and show you what my research is uncovering. But first, let me share this prophetic article that I found. It is from 1958, October 18th, 1958, the Saturday Evening Post. And the article title is Drugs That Shape Men's Minds by Aldous Huxley. You have to listen to this, especially if... You're a student of Christianity and revival and spirituality. He said in 1958, and this is very prophetic, I think, 
that famous revival religion about which so many have been talking for so long will not come about as a result of evangelistic mass meetings or the television appearances of photogenic clergymen. It will come about as a result of biochemical discoveries that will make it possible for large numbers of men and women to achieve a radical self-transcendence and deeper understanding of the nature of things. And this revival religion will be at the same time a revolution from being an activity mainly concerned with symbols. Religion will be transformed into an activity concerned mainly with experience and intuition and everyday mysticism underlying and giving significance to everyday rationality, everyday task and duties, everyday human relationships. If these psychedelics are really producing the same mystical experiences that I've had, that's what I said in my last video. It's not fair that I have them and my mother has it and my wife has it and my son has it. But if they can take a natural plant substance and they can have a mystical experience that profoundly changes them at the very core and changes their life and, and makes them believer in, in the higher power and the afterlife and all the things that religions and spiritual teachings show us the oneness with the universe, why wouldn't I want them to have that? Why wouldn't I want this type of revival to come into the world? He said here, make it possible for large numbers of men and women to achieve a radical self-transcendence and deeper understanding of nature and things, no longer limited to those of us who were blessed with mystical experiences. The second thing I uncovered in my research, and it's showing up more and more, is I'm finding multiple Christian churches, denominations, organizations who are integrating psychedelics into their practices, into their studies, and into their research. They are also teaming up with psychologists and scientists in ways that we never would have believed before. Now, I want to show you a clip of what I'm talking about from a former atheist Dylan DiNardo. Dylan holds an MBA and a bachelor's in finance from Robert Morris University. He's worked in a billion dollar startup as, and, along with a long list of other companies. And now he's the CEO of his own company. This is one smart cat is what I'm getting at. And he's being interviewed. Now, you got to stay with me. Listen to this, guys. What's going on in the world? He's being interviewed by a professor of psychology and a professor of religion and business ethics, both from the University of Pittsburgh, and which which is just mind blowing in itself. And it's on, it gets better. It's on a podcast produced by Ligure, a Christian psychedelic society. And it's hosted by a priest from the Episcopal church who was part of one of the Johns Hopkins Silas Silbin studies. So I'm imagining, I haven't heard his full story that he had such a divine encounter as a priest taking psilocybin at John Hopkins that he's now made it part of his ministry work, his life's work to bring this to the Christian community. I'm going to link to the full Ligari episode in the description below, but just stay tuned for now. On the, the personal side, uh, I was raised in a Christian context, kind of a uh, fundamentalist Pentecostal context. And uh, uh, in my, my 20s, uh, just, uh, I guess, converted to atheism, just just couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't stomach it anymore. Um, but uh, shortly thereafter, my, my atheism did not survive contact with, uh, with psychedelics. So uh, here I am as a, a Christian again. And lastly, and probably the most interesting to me and mind blowing, I'm glad you stay tuned for this. I told you a couple of times I've been wrestling with the, these ideas that these experience initiated by hallucinogenics, are, the, are they the same experience that I had? And my most recent was traveling to another dimension while meditating in front of a guru. So I was blown away when I found this clip. Uh, it's from an awesome channel called Dakota of Earth. I'll link to it below in the description as well. But watch this first. They take a sadhu in India, a religious yogi, and they have him smoke 5-MeO-DMT. Now, 5-MeO-DMT, if you don't know, it's not regular DMT. It is called, uh, nicknamed the God Molecule. And it is arguably the most powerful psychedelic uh, that exists. From my understanding, I've never taken it, but what I've read, you know, DMT, people kind of get blasted away for three to five minutes or something. 5-MeO-DMT, five, uh, five melts you away completely for like a 20 minute blast off. You just, you become one with everything. You're gone out of body kind of deal. And what you're going to see for yourself here, he smokes this, gets into a meditating position and he doesn't collapse, doesn't fall over. He seems to maintain control, which is fascinating. 
And then he comes back and he says, yeah, I've already been to those places before in meditation, which confirms my suspicion that these hallucinogens are creating real experiences. And he goes on to say, what happens is this thing turns on your chakras. It blasts you up to that place. But the difference is you don't really have control. In my practices, I can go to the same place, but I've learned to do it and I have more control over it. I've learned it through the processes of meditation. And he says pranayama, uh, which is breath work. What happens when a Hindu monk smokes DMT? This sadhu in India smoked 5-MeO-DMT and I documented his experience. He hit it and we made sure that there was enough to blast him off. And he just kind of sat there, which is very unusual because most people that smoke this turn into like a dead body, you know, you just collapse. But he just sat there and just took it. And this is what shocked me and changed my whole idea of Hinduism and yoga was that he said he's been there before. Uh, a few times in his deep meditations he's been able to reach those places and i actually believe him if you uh, you have a yoga power and uh, all times chanting omkara all time chanting ram ram then guys psychedelics is starting a revival and let me go on record today as saying it is going to penetrate most of the world's religions over the next 20 years in ways we can't even imagine I hope the church is ready.